Professor Yarrow uh, has been actively involved in the NPM development. As you can see from the presentations from previous uh, speakers, you can see a lot of uh, 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 simulations has done been been done by Alba, and he is a funding member of the Nira 3D community. And I would like to thank you, Alba, on behalf of our organization committee. She has been very helpful to help us to organize the speakers from both the US and the Europe. Uh, so without my further introduction, I would like to welcome Professor Yero and look forward to your presentation. Alba. Thank you, Carter. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK. So well, um, first of all, thank you for, for the introduction. The title of my presentation today is NPM Development for the Simulation of Co-Seismic Landlight and Internal Erosion Processes. Um, and I will begin with the motivation of this work. Basically, we are here gathered together because we want to predict larger formations uh, in geotechnics. Uh, this presentation will focus on NPM. And something that we see is that we have a large variability of of, uh, of um, problems in geotechnics involving larger formations. And I will be focused on those problems that involve uh, failure. Uh, and basically uh, something that we see is that we have lots of different triggering factors controlling the initiation of the failures. So the objective of, um, of, of, my, of this work or of this presentation is to show different developments, uh, recent developments in the field of MPM uh, to address the initiation of different uh, large information failure modes. So in particular, I will address two types of initiation failure modes, which are strong ground motions, earthquakes, and internal erosion. So I cannot uh, proceed with my presentation without acknowledging my students and colleagues uh, who are being part of this work. Uh, the st two students, they are working with me here at Tech, at Virginia Tech are uh, the PG student, Abdel Rahman al Sari and a master student who graduated a few months ago, uh, uh, Julio Copana. And then I'm also working together with uh, John Murphy. He's a PhD student, uh, co-advised uh, co also by Kinichi Soga. And he's working on the internal erosion problem. So I will not spend a lot of time here because all of, I mean, the three previous presenters uh, described the NPM uh, really well and the, and the reasons why this is a, uh, uh, a, a method that we we prefer in front of others and what are the advantages, but also some of the limitations. Uh, so I will jump into the first uh, triggering mechanism, which is earthquake hazard or earthquake or um, strong ground motion. So basically earthquakes can trigger uh, lots of large different types of failures and, con con um, and, and uh, post failure large deformation problems. And one of the most typical are slope stabilities uh, like natural slopes, but also embankments. We also have some uh, lateral spreading affecting civil infrastructure and also uh, this is a, a picture that you, I mean, it's from uh, a liquefaction problem in, in Christchurch. In this, in this presentation, I will be more focused on slope stability and land light uh, uh, problems, but the framework that we are trying to develop uh, should be able to also address uh, these type of problems. So one of the first uh, developments that we propose, basically, if you need to apply, uh, to, you, you are studying the effects of an earthquake, uh, basically, you need to a way to apply this shaking at the, in, in your model, basically. Uh, a few um, uh, references exist, uh, I mean, uh, where you can, you, you, you can find some, uh, that the, the input ground motion is basically applied at the material points. In this paper, we basically uh, propose to apply the, the earthquake ground motion on the, at the boundary itself, because basically we started uh, studying a small scale shaking table problem. So we thought that this was a simple way to, to um, implement that boundary condition. We basically um, 
apply uh, or impose the velocity at the at the boundary nodes consistent with the ground motion and basically the computational cycle it's uh, represented here uh, initially all the material points have the updated information we map these at the nodes where uh, the main governing equations are solved and in this case because the velocity is in is prescribed at the at the at the boundary nodes. Then the near boring uh, the, the particles or the material points located around or near to this boundary, basically they are updated with this uh, prescribed velocity. In the end, we have a deformed uh, geometry. And one of the particularities of this implementation is that we are using also a moving mesh technique. So the mesh moves together with a shaking. Uh, in this way, we kind of minimize the cell crossing and material points crossing from one element to the other one. This is uh, explained in this, uh, in this uh, publication. So uh, we focus on this uh, small scale slope testing uh, that was performed in 1999 by Warman on synthetic clay. Uh, they run different tests on, on similar slopes and shake it on a shaking table. Then they were using, so they had this soft clay on top of a stiffer clay. This clay was synthetic and they this clay presented a strong strain softening behavior. It, has, it, it had moderate strain rate effects and uh, also they observed some shear modulus degradation. So basically they provided on, on a ground motion in terms of acceleration wind that basically covers a frequency content from 1 to 20 hertz and has a peak ground acceleration of 3.46 g. We integrated that in, and then in order to get the velocity time history, and then we applied this on our model. Uh, this is basically our MPM model. Uh, and basically, we can see later on in a couple of slides, you will see some plots that I refer to sensor 11 and sensor 12. These two sensors were located in the original um, uh, shaking table experiment, and they measure basically the, the motion of those points. In our um, MPM model, basically we used uh, material parameters provided by Warman and also by Chen and, and, uh, and Q that who analyzed the exact same um, a shaking table using SPH. So uh, from Warman, we had some um, uh, the, the data from some miniature band shear tests uh, that were provided. Basically, these were showing a, a strong uh, shear, um, shear strain uh, drop from peak to residual conditions. And basically, this was, this was very useful to calibrate our constitutive model. The constitutive model was uh, considered in these simulations was a simple strain softening Tresca model with tension cutoff. And basically, this is the, uh, the strain softening law that we use here, where you have this uh, parameter, eta parameter, but that basically controls how fast the strength drops from peak to residual condition. So uh, we perform some stress strain calibration uh, tests. And in order to simplify this, uh, the, the, the band shear test was approximated as a direct simple shear using mere and wood approximation. So this is how this direct simple, simple shear numerical test look like. Uh, and then basically the results from our numerical calibration and um, the, the experimental data are presented here. Basically, in red, you have the experimental data, and these other lines and dots are um, based on different mesh sizes because we also uh, carry um, perform um, a mesh, a mesh uh, so a, a study to um, an evaluation of how the mesh size was affecting the final results. More details can be found in this in this paper, but basically, this was useful to calibrate this shape factor. And something very important to emphasize here is that this is a simple constitutive model that did not include strain rate effects nor shear modulus degradation uh, of the of the clay. Uh, so these are these are the 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 results. This on top you have the shaking. We provide the divitoric strain 
uh, and this is how this looks like. You can clearly see that this, there is a strain localization uh, along the shear band. And here at the, at the bottom of this slide, we compare on the left-hand side our displacement, final displacement, in like the counter, the, the color counter plot is based on our uh, MPM numerical results. And on top of that, we overlap the initial soil profile, but also the final uh, profile from the experiment, which is the, the line in black. And also the, in red, the SPH uh, ex um, results from, from Chen and Q. Uh, basically, remember that they used an advanced constitutive model, but despite that, the, despite this difference, the simulation or the numerical results look pretty close to ours. In the end, uh, something that we can observe is that both uh, SPH and MPM, they have some issues um, representing or tracking this um, discrete shear than uh, crack uh, at the top of the of the slope. But this, apart from this, the rest of the profile uh, looks pretty uh, similar. And then here on the right, we compare the two different sensors with, so the data from the two different sensors with our NPM results. Note that, so our NPM results basically are the dashed lines and the continuous line is the, the, the data from the experiment, you see that the data from the experiment basically stops at this point. This is because the, the sensor just stopped working after a certain distance. Um, but uh, we are happy because we capture really well the moment, I mean, the beginning of the, the initiation of the failure, as well as the, the, the rate of the, 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 the movement, the, the velocity of the movement and the, um, the, the, the final deformation. After doing this validation, despite using this uh, uh, relatively simple constitutive model, uh, we decided to perform uh, some uh, parametric analysis using a totally theoretical ideal slope. Uh, basically, we subjected this slope to similar shaking, actually not only one, but 25 different ground shakings from many different parts of the world. And basically, with the objective of this uh, parametric, uh, not parametric, but this uh, analysis was to compare our NPM results with different numerical mesh, 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 mesh based techniques like FEM and FDM, also with different new mark approaches that are well uh, used in practice. So, after doing this, uh, this uh, parametric analysis with these 25 uh, ground motions, uh, here, I, we selected two of them, one with a small areas intensity, which is basically a measurement of the magnitude of the, of the, of the earthquake. So, and basically for a small, uh, a low shaking or small shaking uh, um, earthquakes, then uh, what we get is like the, the NPM, FEM, and FDM results match exactly. Uh, and basically, uh, you, here you have in the dashed line is the new mark approach which basically is, uh, provides an estimation of permanent displacement and there is no permanent displacement and because it's just very small deformation. Contrarily, if you select one of the earthquake motions with higher areas intensity, what we observed is something very, very different. So uh, in red, you see the solution from FDM, from FLAC. And what we see is that at some point, basically the FDM just crashes because of bad geometry. Uh, if uh, in, in, in blue, you have the, uh, the line, the, I mean, the, the result from FEM in plexus. And at some point also they accumulate too much error and mesh tangling just avoids uh, pr um, like further calculation. And then in the end, MPM just moves well uh, and can uh, go through the whole simulation until final stabilization. Uh, here we compare also with the Newmark uh, approach and we give, I mean, we have slightly different final, um, so actually we are underestimating a little bit what uh, Newmark predicts, but this is not uh, really a validation because Newmark is a, is a much more simplified method. Uh, and then here are these two pictures, basically on the left, I, uh, here I show you the results from the 25 um, shaking models. So, uh, and something that we 
Uh, on the left hand side, we, we in black, you can see the NPM trends. So these are for different uh, areas in density and different run out. Basically, this is the relationship uh, from NPM, the one uh, which is uh, obtained uh, in black. And then in, in, in blue and purple, you have FEM and FDM. So something very uh, obvious is that after certain uh, areas intensity, FEM and FDM basically crash. On the, uh, on the far right, what we have here is M our NPM results compared to Newmark approaches and other semi-empirical simplified Newmark type uh, approaches that are well used in in uh, in practice too, like Gibson and Shea and Lee, uh, 2011. So in general, we see that in some cases MPM over predicts with respect the others in some cases under predicts. But uh, in general, it, this shows like a really good agreement. At this point, uh, of course, this is a simplified. Oh, these are like first steps in order to model large scale problems. And in order to do, do this, we also need to uh, focus on uh, the proper modeling of side response. To do that, uh, basically we are focusing on further treatment of boundary conditions like attached boundaries, viscous and free field boundaries. So we are implementing this well knowledge uh, from FEM. We are implementing this to MPM. And of course, we also need to provide uh, advanced constitutive models, which include cycling loading uh, features. So at this point, I want to jump into the second part of my presentation, which is a total different story. But basically, the idea is that here we want to uh, ask, study another type of uh, triggering failure mechanism, which is basically based on internal erosion. So internal erosion uh, can be understood as the particles or fines migrating as a result of seepage. In one of the, these processes is called suffusion process and is basically represented here at the bottom. Actually, well, this picture is a, it's a well-known uh, uh, failure, which is the Teton Dam failure that happened in 1976 here in the US in Idaho. Uh, and basically was triggered by internal erosion, but there are uh, many other cases, uh, case histories, um, um, that are um, suffering from this type of process. So basically what we see here is that we, we may have like uh, B model type of soil with coarser grains, finer grains. And then as soon as you sub apply some seepage water uh, moving through these pores, then some of the fines can migrate. And in the end you have a, a loser's material that eventually can collapse and uh, can induce failure. So basically, uh, this can be understood as a mass transfer problem in a continuum framework. So in the end, these are phase diagrams in a very simple way. What we have is a fully saturated soil where the solid part is basically can be divided in erodible part and non-erodible or what we call solid skeleton. If we uh, apply some seepage here, depending on a particular uh, specific law, then we uh, the, um, the erodible grains can erode and eventually you can have this, uh, this, this uh, scenario. So we are working on two different NPM approaches in saturated conditions. We have the single point that previous presenters mentioned about that, but also we have the we are the developing uh, extending the double point in, in NPM. Basically, the idea is to uh, include this mass transfer in the single point and also in the double point. Something important here is that on the left hand side for the single point, the mass transfer happens in the same set of material points. So the mass transfer goes from the solid to the liquid, but everything, all variables are represented in the same uh, integration points. While on the double point NPM, we need to map some information and transfer this solid mass from the, from the solid, this is wrong. So it should be solid material points to the liquid material point. Here are some uh, publications about this. Very quickly, well, in general, uh, we need to add some mass balance for the fluid grains, but the most important thing is that we need to add an erosion law that basically connects the micro scale mechanism with a large scale framework. Uh, same, similar set of equations for the double point, but something important here is that the erosion law needs to map mass from the solids 
to the liquid material point. Then uh, here I present just two theoretical scenarios on the left-hand side, uh, an application of the single point MPM formulation. You see that these material, these are small uh, strain or uh, small deformation problems. Uh, basically, we are prescribing the velocity in this way, so we can see how the porosity increases first at the center, and then also, I don't know why this is not running properly. Okay, I will move on. Uh, and then here on the double point formulation, you see how the liquid material point really moves through the, through the mesh. And here is where you have the soil specimen. I'm not plotting here the solid material point just for, to, to, for clarification. And basically in the end, in this uh, problem, we are uh, applying the boundary condition as a dropping to the head. And basically here we have clean water. And then suddenly, I mean, as a result of the internal erosion becomes muddy water. Finally, uh, we are working on the validation of these two formulations using uh, experimental data from um, STERPI. Uh, STERPI uh, 2003, they perform or she performed some um, seepage tests. And basically, we are trying to reproduce uh, this, uh, this numerical, uh, this experimental data with both single point and double point. Uh, she proposed an erosion law, and this is the one that we are implementing. Right, uh, we have implementing. Uh, we are implementing in the in the um, in our simulations. Uh, we see that single point fits really well the analytical solution. Double point still is has some error. We are investigating that uh, currently. So in the end, I just want to acknowledge that we are part of this Anura 3D community. We are using the Anura 3D software. Of course, internal versions of that, and not everything is uh, out there uh, as um, in open source. But uh, our work is uh, to move forward with this community. And thank you for your attention. Uh, we have uh, one quick question uh, from Monlu Tongji University. How to apply the dynamic loading when simulating the earthquake-induced landslides? use the NPM, and uh, use which index of earthquake loading? Can you repeat, sorry? Uh, so the, the question is how to apply the dynamic loading when simulating the earthquake-induced landslides using NPM? How to apply the dynamic loading? Yeah. Well, the dynamic loading is basically applied at in, in these simulations at the base of the so if you have a shaking table, we basically apply the, the ground motion uh, at, the, at, the, at the boundary nodes. But in a real case scenario, if you have a larger, a large scale problem where it's not realistic to have these uh, lateral boundaries, then you need to work on more advanced boundary conditions that reflect these, ener these waves uh, and they don't basically come back into the model. Uh, so avoid these reflections. Uh, and so you basically apply the ground motion at the, at the bottom and you make sure that the boundaries work properly. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you. I answered yeah. the question. Thank you, Alba. I, I think uh, the time is up and uh, I'll handle the session to you and you may chair the session. Yeah. Sure.